my my hair thankfully is still there it's turning a little gray but my beard's like white and she made a comment about that and i said yeah that's that's revelation chapter one that's the description of the lord so my beard by definition is divine how about that what you mean? hey uh mikey do me a favor young man uh Lou, you, you have easier act. Can you bring me a water? Like, where's the water? You have water? Never mind, she'll get it. I don't know if it's in one of those. All right, uh, it's good to be back. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 17. Look at verse 22. It's good to be back. No place like home. Had a really good time with Brother Jay Scruggs, Pastor Jay Scruggs and his uh, Tennesseans. It's good to see... Young people uh, still in the fight. We've probably been up there preaching for him. Uh, this is probably our fourth time up there. The interesting part about that is usually after our, our week-long deal is a, like the last three years, the Sodomites have been having some kind of, uh, it's in a park. It's not a parade. Rally. It's a rally. Yeah, it's an event. Let's go that route. It's an event, and so the last two times we were able to street preach, and then the third one, unfortunately, the way the schedule worked out, we didn't get a chance to participate in it. But uh, it's it's interesting because this is what I this is how I pick up on it, what I pick up from that. The the devil and his crew they're very organized, like the communists and all that. They're very organized, right? The sodomites, very. Hey, Brody, have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, the sodomites, very organized, right? And we are the ones that win. Because I read the back of the book, right? I read the end. We win. We win. We go. It's all good. And it's so very difficult at times. It's like herding cats when it comes to Christians. And we, we just got to make a call. That's why we preach, I guess. That would be kind of like the raw, raw stuff and what we do. And it's our, it should be rather, our desire to be able to serve with a willing heart, right? Our Savior, he's the one, thank you. He's the one to beat out death, correct? Muhammad never beat out death. Confucius never beat out death. None of them beat out death. Jesus Christ beat out death. So it, uh, it, uh, that's our motivation, but you need to, Stay in your Bible, obviously, and, and, and stay around other people that are motivated. And, and it helps you with that. But I find it interesting with those sodomites in there. Why you pick that little town? Like, where, where they have, it's literally like, you know, you ever seen uh, back in the day, what was the name of that? Uh, Andy Griffin? You ever see that? Andy Griffin? It's like that. And it's like, what would you pick out of all the, the towns to be able to have an event like that and what should have happened in a town like that would have been or any town I guess there should have been about 200 fell 200 people out there on the church's side and you need to understand when it comes to street preaching it's not that anybody would have preached a message because we wouldn't preach a message like this this is what they think street preaching is this is what they think we're there for this is what they think your message is. All you sodomites are going to hell because you're gay. And that's not the message. That is never, that's not the message of your Bible. We would never preach that. What we preach is Christ Jesus and him crucified. We would preach the hope in Jesus Christ. We would preach you must be born again. See, stuff like that. The sin of Sodom, e, sodomy, the sin of Sodom, it's not the act. That's not what, like, a sodomite doesn't go to hell because he's gay. And that's, you got to understand that. That's why it's so very important to be in church and to learn and to read your Bible and to, to be around other people like that because that's the perception. The perception is you hate gays. We don't hate gays. I don't hate anybody. I, I'm a sinner. All of sin. All unrighteousness is sin. See? A sodomite doesn't go to hell. If he goes to hell, he doesn't go to hell because he's gay. Uh, a sodomite goes to hell because he's not saved. A drunk doesn't go to hell because he drinks. That's not what, what sends him to hell. Uh, a thief doesn't go to hell because he steals. 
However, this is how this, this works. If the sodomy, the act of sodomy, or your alcohol, or your addiction, keeps you from receiving Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior, then I would say, then, that, then I guess that's what it was, right? But the Bible says in John 3, you all, you know, uh, we're condemned already. So our message to anybody, and that goes for doing personal work, or, or you're at somebody's house, or you're at the restaurant, or Walmart, or wherever you're at, is it Jesus saves? It's just that. We're all condemned. The difference between a lost man and a saved man is that the saved guy, saved person, understood the fact and the best way they knew how, they believed on Jesus Christ, right? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's that. I got saved. There are all sorts of sins. You got little kids driving now? That's interesting. He probably got a... He probably... He probably got a a, 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 a a phone book to sit on. All right, anyway, so that's that. So we had a good opportunity to be there. We had a good time while we were there. Pray for uh, Lee's Chapel Baptist Church. Keep them encouraged. Help them out. And we'll keep doing what we do down here. And he said to us to make sure we told everybody hello. And he's going to make it a point when it comes to our revival Right to be part of that. He missed it this last time because you know how he was wicked. That's why. Anyway, that's not. No, that's not true. All right. Uh, Luke chapter seventeen, verse twenty-two. Right. So we're talking, and this is it. I'm going to finish up this series here uh, about Jesus Christ. We specific coming back. We specifically looked at the two characters. I think it's very important. Uh, it's not limited. Jesus Christ's return isn't limited to just what he says about Lot. And knowing Lot, however, I think it's a very interesting perspective when it comes to anticipation, right? You should be ready. The Bible says we should be ready. Um, we should be like waking up in the morning and, Lord, whatever you'd have me to do today, thank you for the day, right? Um, and if today's a good day for you to come back. And we need to have a mindset that there's nothing more important, nothing would help us more than Jesus Christ coming back. And I'll show you that the characteristics that Lot had, uh, and these are the days of Lot. If we're in the days of Lot, I believe we're in the days of Lot, that he's, his, one of his main issues is lingering, right? And that's what, you know, you could look and I say the, the, the characteristics of both Noah and Lot, man, they're very prevalent. So today will be the last day we go over this. I'll go over this in the AM service. We'll finish it up in the PM service. And if there's anything that you need to take out of this is that, man, I don't know what other box to check to validate that Jesus Christ is coming soon. I, I don't know because I can't, I can't tell you reading what I know, well, knowing what I know about this Bible and kind of seeing half looking at this world, what condition it's in. You can't possibly say we, we're going to be here you know, oh man, we got another 50 years, Pastor. You just a little extreme in your interpretation of the scripture. I can't imagine thinking that way. Unless you got the mindset that Lot has. So let's look at this. Did we pray already? Did we pray? We did not pray? All right, Brother Kyle, you pray. Dear Lord, we the privilege and the honor to be here this morning. We have a church built and we're going to go over. Thank you for being our pastor back. Pray, Lord, for the scripture. Pray, Lord, for the message. All right, look at verse, thank you, verse 22. Uh, now the Bible says, And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And ye shall say, and they shall say unto you, See here or see there. Now go not after them, nor follow them, for as the lightning that lighteth up out of the one part under heaven shineth unto another part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first, right, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So therein lies one of the proofs that nobody looked forward to the cross because he's trying to tell his disciples that I got to suffer these things. And every time he talks to them about that, they don't know what he's talking about. 
So much so that it wasn't until after he resurrected in the last chapter of the book of Luke that he explains how he showed up in the Old Testament, which means they didn't know that that was him in the Old Testament. They did not know or look forward to any cross, right? And that's just one more proof text for that, all right? Uh, look at verse 26. So he goes on to say, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And he did eat and drank, and they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and they drank, and they brought, uh, they bought, they also sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So, uh, since we started this, right, and we put up an emphasis on Jesus Christ coming back, because I don't know that you could read the Bible and not pick up, there's an emphasis that the Lord comes back. There's so many different types of Jesus Christ, right, being raptured out, or rather the, the church being raptured out. <clears throat> there's so many... Verses that talk about Jesus Christ coming out, coming back. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Look at verse 1. John chapter 14. So when we're going through what we're going through, and we talked about this on Sunday night or Wednesday night, this is what I'd hope to accomplish. So I would say to you, uh, I pray for you to get the message, and then your prayer for whoever's preaching here would be, that we preach the message so you can understand. My prayer is that you understand the message, then your prayer would be, well, then you got to preach it in a way that we can understand it. And I would say most of the time, it's not so much that we didn't explain ourselves, but but rather it comes to, you just got to have the right heart to hear what you're about to hear. Because the world ain't interested in Jesus Christ coming back. They don't mention it. Matter of fact, if you... Uh, <laughs> I saw a little bit of the debate. I did not watch that debate live. I was listening to some preaching. I thought that was a better use of my time. But I did look at some of the highlights. And what, what got me about all that is that at one point of that debate, the two of them went after each other over a golf game. And so I'm like, man, out of everything that could be discussed with the two most powerful fellas in the world or potentially whoever's going to be the president, you look at this guy talking about, I could hit a golf ball farther than you can. And I thought, man, that's like high school stuff. Anyway, so when it comes to this, this, this preaching here, at least this teaching about Jesus Christ coming back, I would hope that as we progress through here, there would be some level of accomplishment or some completion in our, our description. So we would say that while reading that, when we study the days of Noah and the days of Lot, we'll study the text here. And the text that you got here uh, in this, in the book of Luke, is this one right here. They're just living life. You could see very clearly that the emphasis there is that, you know, when the Lord comes back, when he's revealed, everybody's just doing their own thing, and there's no reference at all. Noah's called the preacher of righteousness, and you don't hear anything about the preaching. So I would say then, leading to Jesus Christ returning, the first part of the second coming, we call it the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right? Uh, would be that it's just this nonchalant attitude, like it's just, uh, we don't even talk about it. But I want to make a point to talk about it because I read enough Bible to know he's coming back. And then I know enough Bible in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which I would love for every one of you to get, is a crown of righteousness, and the crown of righteousness that you would get at the judgment seat of Christ, amongst other things, gold, silver, precious stones, right, would be you get that crown of righteousness, for simply loving his appearing. And then again, I would say, wow, like what Christian wouldn't get that crown? That would almost be like a participation trophy, wouldn't it? Until you start spending time with Christians and realize, man, there are very few Christians that even acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming back. But I don't want it to happen here. I want to get you at least one crown, right? Like I want one crown. So I'm going to talk about it a lot, all right? So it would be that the first part of that, you'd acknowledge that very few people get saved. And that very few people are participating in the ministry, right? There'd be eight people total saved in, in, in Noah's time. But he was a preacher and his whole family stayed intact. That's a bonus. Because when you go and look at the characteristic at Lot, 
his family didn't stay intact, right? So you could look at the text there in Luke 17, and then you could look at the individual characteristics and in supporting document, no, supporting scriptures or verses that go along with both Noah and Lot, and you'll see all sorts of these interesting characteristics. And as, as thorough as I want to be with these characteristics, again, after going through all this, I can't imagine you going through half of what we talked about and walking away thinking, man, I still got another 50 years. We're good, Pastor. You're not even close to any of that. And you are not nowhere near that. You're right there. Matter of fact, I would check all the boxes. There's not anything I can imagine. All right, so the second part of that would be that in the days of Noah, there's this supernatural deal, right? There'll be the, the giants and there'll be the sons of God stuff, all this supernatural stuff. And I was thinking about the giant part for a second. Now, you can go online and you can see that they have found historically all these uh, archaeological digs, you know, as a result of these archaeological digs, that they find these giant skeletons and stuff, right? And I don't, I don't know what that is. It, they say that's what it is. Some of the claims is that uh, those Smithsonians, Smith, Smithsonians, they're not honest. Like, they find all these different things and they stole them away. They store them away. They don't present them, right? So these archaeologists or these scientists find these things that will either refute evolution or they confirm things in the Bible. And when it comes to displaying those things and giving the ability for the individuals to decide for themselves where they fit, supposedly they're not being presented. No, I don't know that either. I don't know that to be the case. But I was thinking, like, so where would the giants actually fall? Is that all we got? If it's like the days of Noah and part of that, there were giants in those days. And then the Bible talks about there are going to be giants after those days. Where do the giants fit in? Well, I could tell you it would also be in your folklore. It would be in your Hollywood deal because if you watch those Marvel movies, that purple guy, he was a giant, you know, and you see that in those different movies. The adversary is typically a giant. You have Jack and the Beanstalk type thing. You have the folklore of the, the king fighting the giant or whatever, so you see a lot of that. But recently I heard somebody talking about uh, business and the guy used this term that such and such was a giant right in the business and I went aha so it could be that there's a physical manifestation of giants supernaturally speaking right and I believe that to be the case I believe you'll see that probably more so in the tribulation time period right that's when it all comes to fruition now all you got to do is read the book of revelation after starting in Revelation chapter 6, to see a lot of that literally and physically showing up. So this would be, as you're heading into this, this satanic influence is getting you geared up to be able to accept it. Of course, prior to any of that, right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 talks about we're going to be, <clears throat> we're not appointed under the wrath of God. So this time period is likened unto the wrath of God. That's, that's because you're going to find some preachers and some YouTube people that insist that the church is going to go through the tribulation. So you hear terms like, oh, he's a giant in the business. He's a giant in the movie base. So, so there's that. Matter of fact, if you're a football player or a football fan, you'll hear things like the New York Giants, right? And you're baseball and the Giants. And now you start connecting the dots with all that stuff. You say, but, 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 but what is all that? Okay, so if it's not a physical giant walking up and down the road uh, towards your house or whatever, uh, there are things being referenced, right, uh, through Hollywood and through different things on your television and Netflix and all that stuff and, and your folklore is, is getting you used to this here. And if you're watching these uh, science fiction movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still, you know, when that alien came out, right, which is a type of a son of God, He's connected to a female. And then when they shoot the guy, right, the army guys shoot the guy, and then out comes this giant, right, like 15, 20 foot metal, of course it's going to be metal, this metal giant robot looking thing. So if you read your Bible and you believe what you're reading, it, it starts being very evident in that somebody's trying to condition you. That's why we had talked about the creature of the Black Lagoon. There's this deal with these mutations that are cohabitating with females. You get that from Dracula, right? Or Frankenstein, the mummy. And uh, I'll tell you, if you look at the 
science fiction movies in the 50s they were real big like every monster right is always holding the female always holding the female and you're getting that and i don't know like if you were ever into like the uh the um what were they called the the, the x-men like i wasn't really into the x-men but i know enough about the x-men that the theme to find out or to know the theme of the x you guys know what the x-men are so they're mutations right they say evolutions are mutation. The evolutionary process is through mutations. There is no such thing as re uh, a mutation, a mutant being able to reproduce, by the way. When they cross a horse and a donkey, you know what they call that? They call it a mule, right? And you know what I know about when you do stuff like that? You know what I know about the mule? He can't reproduce, right? So there is none of that. That's beware of oppositions of science falsely so-called. But when you... When you uh, when you watch all these different things there, and they're getting you uh, uh, conditioned like this creature, the Black Lagoon thing went from the thing chasing the girl into the swamp to the, the shape of water, right? Which is the title of that movie where the, where the creature, the amphibian, of course, he's the fit, like represents the fifth cherub. He's an amphibian. He then, she rather, falls in love with the thing. And then you get the Twilight series and the thing falls in love with the vampire and wants to become the vampire. That changed. When I was a kid, everybody ran from the vampire. Now, these generations here, uh, they're all wanting to be. Amen? There's that spiritual deal. It's called the seducing spirit in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And whatever this is, it's getting you geared up to be able to accept stuff like that. All right, so we had talked about the increase in the sodomites, right? So you're living in a nation that sodomy, communism, terrorism are all being accepted and respected more than what God is doing in this country, right? You, you are literally looking at individuals that, that march in support of sodomites, communists, and terrorists. They, they support that. They're, in, they're taking over your campuses and... and promoting everything that God says, that's that's demonic, that's wicked, right? That's the stuff that we preach about. And so you're seeing the increase of this and the decrease of the influence of God in your country. So everything that you're going over, everything we start going over and discussing whatever, you're seeing that this is more prevalent as we go on. This X-Men deal, right? Going back to that for a second. That X-Men deal, the whole premise of that is is that you bigoted human beings, you don't accept these mutations. And the whole entire series is based on that, to where the, the normal humans, right, are acknowledging the fact there's something wrong with the mutations, right? And they're constantly trying to stop the mutations, where the X-Men on the other side, there's a good group of X-Men, of course, and there's a bad group of X-Men, and there's like, okay, so there's good witches and bad witches. And that's the mentality there. That's that yin and yang stuff. And that's where the devil's more subtle than any beast of the field. But there is no yin and yang in the Bible, see? You're not both saved and lost at the same time, see? You are saved or lost. You are, witchcraft is wrong in your Bible, right? Sorcery is wrong in your Bible, see? They're not good they're, in Hollywood. They're, see, they're trying to get you to where if you don't accept whatever's, being, whatever's on its way, and right now, most of it's just television. But that mindset, because you call, you know what you call television? You know what you call what you see on television? You call it a program, right? And you call it a channel. You know what channeling is? See, see, the devil's got, if he's, if, 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 if 2 Corinthians 4 identifies the devil as being the god of this world, then the world system is being run by the devil. And it doesn't take you long. You can get a dime store Bible without any notes in it. And your ability to be able to read and study that book will expose that kind of stuff, which is why the devil throws all sorts of obstacles in your way or uh, distractions, right, to where you don't, you don't read it. And then when you preach a message on this or try to teach, man, wow, wow, we're close to the rapture, man. And you listen for about five minutes. You say, my goodness, man, you talk about creature of the black lagoon. And sodomites, man, what's the deal with that? And I'm telling you, that's the deal with that. So we could hopefully look at these things as we're presenting them and uh, see that. I don't know what other boxes to, to check. Uh, the last three that I have for you today, 
um, are lingering. And in pride and in alcohol, and I would tell you this, there's more than that. But the more I present to you, like we can almost keep this going indefinitely, and I'll show you, and you should hopefully at least, if you don't understand what I'm saying, hopefully you're in a position to want to. Because I get it. I've been saved for a long time, and I've went through a lot of this stuff. I've had this explained to me. I've looked it up myself. I, I do what I can to prove stuff. I've had people come to me and introduce certain thoughts about the Bible and like, you know, okay, I'm interested. And if you would say, you know what, Pastor, I'm not sure about all that. I would say, fine, let's talk about it. But, you know, you're living in the great age of nobody wants to talk about anything anymore. They just want to yell at you, right, or cancel you or, or they'll just get up and leave without having a level of discussion about a certain something. All right, so you guys, <clears throat> are you in John chapter 14? <clears throat> All right, look at verse 1. And he says this, <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. <clears throat> so what does he say with all this? So everything that you see about going on, you know, that's going on, whether it's political or whether it's national or whether it's uh, religious or whatever, the economy, there's a common thread in that Bible. In that, if you learn to trust Jesus Christ, Number one is your personal savior. Number two, that he's in charge of all this. Then you just live a better, you, go, you, can, you can live a quiet life, see? What happens is people don't have enough faith to believe what's written, and they don't have a quiet life. They don't have a peaceable life. Their marriages are a mess. Their relationships with people, they're all anxious all the time. They're always in the midst of something, right? And they're very inconsistent. And well, that would be the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, all right? Uh, look at verse 2. He says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you i go to prepare a place for you. And then I want you to pay attention verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, right, I will come again, right, and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there you may be also. So those are the type of verses that you got to, to, to memorize and hide in your heart. Those are the verses that you need to keep reading, right? And uh, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse 19. And the more I read this Bible, the more uh, that whole second coming thing becomes a reality. So I was talking to brother A. a. Ron, right? He's a CPR guy in Tennessee, right? He came down here and presented about soul winning. Our missionary, yes. And we were talking, and he said, you know, Pastor, the more I read my Bible, the more I am wanting to see Jesus Christ. And I said, that's a bingo, man. That's it. That's the key. I, if I had a pill for you, I'd tell you take a pill since we're living in a pill popping nation, right? Everything is a pill, right? First Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 19. For what is our hope? Is it politics? Is it finances? Is it, is it a two-state solution? Or what's our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ? See? At his coming. At his coming. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 1. So you start reading these things, and on, during your normal Bible reading, you're getting these things that are being brought up about Jesus Christ coming back. And why does Jesus Christ do it like that? Why does he have people like Paul write that stuff down? Why did he mention in John chapter 14? Well, like, so if you're a parent, right, how many times did you have to tell your kid until he started understanding that's his responsibility to take the trash out, right? How many times did you have to discipline him, get to the point where you disciplined him so he got the message? It probably was a few times, right? That's why the Bible says things like, "Be weary, don't be weary in well-doing. It takes effort to do right, by the way. I, I, I know that to be the case myself because it's very easy for me just to stay at the house and watch TV than it is for me to, I don't know, go take a shower, go get dressed, go iron clothes or whatever. You know, you know my wife says trim my beard, but that's the beard's divine. It's white. Yours isn't. I don't know what to tell you about that one. You need to shave yours. I'm going to keep mine. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, right? Verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the ga our, 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 our gathering together unto him. See? So what is that? Oh, you, is that not something that's going to happen? Is that any? Do you think that's far-fetched? 
that there's going to be this calling away type thing. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 25. Now, I read a handful of these when we first got started 30 weeks ago. But I thought, let me just kind of rehash this a little bit so, you you know. If you're not in your Bible, you don't understand, man. And I want you to understand. I want you to get a crown. I want you to get all the crowns. I, there's five of them, by the way. I think there's more, but but I've been taught it was five. I think the more I read, especially the book of Proverbs, there's so much to be had. And when God says things like, you've been faithful in a few things, why would you say that? Like, if your boss wouldn't say that, he gave you a list of things to do, and he came around to check them, and he said, hey, it's pretty good. You did a few of them, so I'm going to give you a raise. Your, do your, your boss don't talk that way. He's going to get all over you, fools, about the rest of them. But you know your God, it's almost like he kind of knows who he's working with, and he don't expect much from us. Like, right? I don't want to minimize our role. I don't want to minimize our efforts. But, man, you ever deal with people? You ever deal with? All right, I'll give you a challenge. Ready? Go to any fast food joint that you choose and see if they, they get that right. See if they get your fries right. See if they can put a hamburger fries and give you something else, whatever you order. See if they, they can figure out how to put all that in a bag and hand it to you, right? Without having you pull over and you got to pull back and where's this and where's that. I'm telling you, you're living in an age right now, they can't get fast food right, right? And it's a mess. All right? Revelation chapter 2, look at verse 25. But that which you have already, what that which ye have already, and I would tell you, you got a lot of stuff already. You got, God's been giving you stuff. The day you got saved, you got eternal life. But then you build on that. And then the stuff that you got about the Lord coming back, you got a lot of that stuff already. So what's the directive? Ready? Hold fast. Keep that stuff. Keep it. Build on it, right? Uh, internalize it. Exercise it, right? And then what's the time frame on that? So I come. That means don't stop. I'll let you know when it's time. I'll let you know when it's the, the, when the whistle blows, right? It's quitting time, right? Back in the day, if you're working at a factory, those guys would know it's time, like in the end of the, the Flintstone, the beginning of the Flintstone, right? He's on that dinosaur, and the thing blows, and he goes, yabba dabba do, man. One of these days, you'll be doing the yabba dabba do up in heaven, right? The clouds, the Lord's going to call you up out of here, and hopefully, hopefully, you got to walk with Jesus Christ that you can you can go ahead and say, yabba dabba do. All right, look at the very last chapter of your Bible. Look at verse 20. It would be like the, 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 la the second to the last verse of your Bible. And my point is that what little Bible you should know, if you sat through any of this, you can't possibly walk out of here without believing you have some responsibilities. Then Jesus Christ is coming. Because I'm going to tell you, you got responsibilities. I, I'm not minim I don't want to minimize that. I'm just saying, I'll just tell you, man, maybe like you probably get more than what you think you got. But then at the same time, you got to be careful because there's a thing called the deceitfulness of sin to make you think that you're okay when you're not okay. So how do you know the difference, Pastor? How we figure that out? I don't know how you figure it out. How do you figure it out? You prove it, right? Whatever it is you're doing, whatever your schedule is, whatever your calendar looks like, whatever your purpose in life seems to be, make sure God's in it. That's all I can tell you, because I did. You say, man, you just out here in the back end of Homestead, man, not a whole lot going on. There's more going on here than you know. And I'm going to keep doing what God called me to do. And I don't know, man, I sleep very well at night. And I'll take a bunch of pills to get to sleep. I ain't all worried. My hair falling out. Thank God. Still got hair. <laughs> all right. Revelation chapter 22, look at verse 20. And he which testify these things says, Surely I come quickly, even so come Lord Jesus. Now, now look at the last verse in your Bible. Last verse in your Bible. Let me get to it. And look what he tells you. So the second to the last verse in your Bible is that the Lord's coming, correct? All right, look at verse 21, though. Because he knows you got things to do, and he knows it ain't over. It ain't over till it's over. Until then, well, what's the verse say? He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Why would you say that? Why would he say that? Why would he say, why would he bring up the grace of God? Hmm? You're darn right we need it, man. That's it. Jesus Christ says to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. 
And it's the key right there that's going to get you to a point when Jesus Christ finally comes, he fulfills that. I'm here. I told you I was coming. I've been telling you I was coming. I showed you all sorts of whatever. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 19. I showed you all sorts of things. I told you I was coming. You've been hearing preaching on it. You've been hearing messages on it. You've been hearing teachings on it. And now that day comes. There's a, there's a day coming that, that there'll be an end to your faith. Faith, remember what faith is, right? The evidence of things, uh, what is it? faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence, the evidence, the evidence of things not seen. So that you'll be without excuse. There's every, everything that you need to follow Jesus Christ, you have. What you do with it, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Uh, that's why you read historically where you got these particular nations and they don't know how to mine or they don't know how to take stuff and, and create anything with what they got. And you hear about these powers coming in and, you know, they're calling the colonizers and all this stuff. But you hear stories about these tribes over here that had no idea there was a lake right, right over the mountain. And it wasn't until, you know, the English came over there and they call it Lake Victoria or something weird like that. And the reality of it is everything that you need to, to be uh, a workman, right? You got now how you mine it, how you connect with it. That's your responsibility. And I would tell you, knowing what I know about Christianity, that God's given you the ability to be able to do that. And you can win out if you don't win out at the judgment seat of Christ and you wind up suffering loss and you don't come back. I think you might not come back to reign. You're going to heaven and all that good stuff. But that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ over here, this deal right here. I don't know. That's coming back right here at the end of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 19. And then right here, Revelation 20 talks about the thousand year reign. The devil's, you know, he's, he's bound up in that pit right there for a thousand years. Well, you get an opportunity to reign with him. That's where those crowns come in, right? That judgment seat of Christ takes place somewhere while the tribulation is going on. And that, and that there's a marriage supper there. Uh, you got a judgment seat of Christ going on. So you're going to get judged based on your level of Christianity, not, not, not if you're saved or not. That's already been determined at the cross. But your judgment seat will determine what you get. It'll, it'll determine what you get as a result of what you did with your gift. It's called a gift, right? Well, what would you do with the gift? So what are you doing with the gift of eternal life that you have? And I'll tell you, in, in, in Miami, Christians, they ain't doing a whole lot with what they got. And I'm telling you, you got the power. You have it. And everybody keeps pointing you in another direction. The power is this. The power is that. You know, the power of Greystone, right? The He-Man guy. You got some super. You got to tap into Netflix. You got to do all this. You got to come and take another pill or whatever. Smoke this or drink this. And it ain't. It's in what's within you, right? And that's what you got to get a hold of. Once that judgment seat of Christ is over with, that's the honeymoon. That's your thousand-year reign, by the way. And I would hate to think that you and I are. I want. I'm coming. I want to come back, man. I. I want to come back. You, you ever heard this, man? You want to give them a piece of your mind? That's coming. That ain't now. You'll have that opportunity. You want to stomp people out? Yeah, man. We're gonna get all this. We want to start a militia? It ain't now. Don't let that devil get you all out of place. That's coming. The day when you have an opportunity to do that is when you come back with Jesus Christ, Revelation 19. So it's a wild deal, man. You see, that's going to happen for real. Yeah, that's going to happen for real. If you if you are able to come back with him, I don't know. Maybe you do. I right, look at this now. Now now, Genesis chapter 19. Look at verse 15. And when the morning arose. Then the angels hasten lot. You know what the word hasting, hasting mean? Hastes. Okay, come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. You know what? You know what preaching is designed to do? To, to stir you up, man. Get you going. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You know, if you have a football coach, you know what you want him to do? Man, get, get the football team going, man. We want to win the championship, right? You have coach of the year. You know what the coaches of the year do? They hasten their crew. You know what a sergeant does? You know what a drill instructor does? You know what a leader, a general does? He's the one that rallies the troops, right? And everybody's like, yeah, we love that general, man. He won World War II like Patton or Douglas MacArthur or uh, Halsey and all them guys. 
But yet, when it comes to the things of God, you don't want anybody getting in your face, right? You don't want anybody talking to you like that. But that's not, you know, how you got to learn how to allow yourself to be in a position to be able to. They, if it ain't going to be the, the pastor or it ain't going to be somebody that you know that knows that Bible trying to help you out, that's a supernatural intervention that Lot got. So those are angels doing that. It's like, I don't want the supernatural kick in the butt, man. I don't want that. I would rather have a conversation with you and you encourage me and iron sharpen its iron, go that route, right, to get the job done. I don't need to meet God outside of this. I don't want to meet God outside. I don't want to go through the whipping. I've been through the whipping machine. That's, that's Hebrews chapter 12, right? Look at verse 15. Genesis chapter 19. Now, this is this. I'm going to tell you where we're at. This is this. This is the lingering part. And one of the biggest characteristics that I know that we're in the midst of Leading to Jesus Christ coming back is the fact that Christians have this bad habit of thinking, this is how they think. Now, you, if you're a business person, like you guys are business people, you work or do whatever, or you want to garden, or you want to raise kids, you cannot be an effective parent or an owner or an employee with this mentality. Ready? Tomorrow for sure. Tomorrow we'll get around. We'll get it eventually, Pastor. There's no reason to come off the chain like that or to constantly trying to get us to do stuff that we won't want to do. You can't do anything unless you get the mindset and have the right heart about being able to do things you don't want to do, right? That's working out. Like if you want to change, like you want to lose weight, then you got to do stuff you don't want to do, like say no to gummy worms and stuff, man, which is half satanic if you ask me. But, but this is what's going on in the church today. There's so much lingering there. So whatever Lot's going through at the time, these things got to literally grab a hold of him, right? And then I'll show you that when, the, when this, in, this, this fire and brimstone thing is going to, it's evident that this is happening. Even after everything that Lot heard and what he's seeing and this interaction he still pumps the brakes on all that. And I'll tell you, he loses his whole, he, the whole family comes apart. And I don't want that for anybody. I don't want that for me. Well, I wouldn't want that for you. Because I think family, the family itself is the first institution that was created in the Bible, right? It was Adam and Eve, and they were told to, to, to replenish and be fruitful and multiply which is the devil immediately came before they had an opportunity to do anything, and he busted the two apart, right? So that's a satanic intervention. All right, verse 15, And when the morning arose, and the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife, right, and two daughters. That's his family. But who does he tell? Who do they tell? Who, who's given the directions? Who's given the directive? It's Lot. He don't go to Lot's wife. He don't go to the kids. And what you got today is, well, let's see what the kids want to do, honey. Let's see what let's see what the wife wants to do. And sister, uh, brother, kid, whatever. Uh, that's not how this thing is set up. And he loses his wife. So what's going on over here to where that has to be like that? What what happened in the raising of the kid? What happened at the house? To where the best thing Lot can do is offer his two daughters up to those sodomites. Like, like you don't read that that during that situation in the same chapter that Lot turns around to these two angels and asks for help. What you have as a result of being saved is you have access to Jesus Christ, don't you? You got access to the throne room. It's called the throne of grace, right? And it's what Jesus Christ said, I want to give you because you're going to need my grace to be able to do whatever it is you're doing. You need God's grace just to make it through the day. Otherwise, you'd be a crazy person. If everything that went on in your life, that goes on in your life, man, you're unable to control yourself, that is the definition of a crazy person because now you're, you're angry all the time and God forbid you get to the point where you're bitter. And if you get a root of bitterness in Hebrews chapter 12 as a result of circumstances, Man, that root of bitterness, that's hard to overcome. And I've seen many, 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 many Christians over the years. They quit church. They quit God. They stop doing what God's called them to do because they're just bitter because 
the, the, what the pastor did or said, or, or more, more so what the other person did, like they sat in their chair or something crazy like that. And that should never be the case for any one of you if you got the armor of God on. You got to put the whole armor of God on. You got to get used to understanding and recognizing, rather, that, that you're to war a good warfare. So this is why, I, think about this. So if you look at the Jew today, everything they're going through is physical, right? Although they spiritually neglected Christ, right? So they struck out in Acts chapter 7, and then Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch got saved, right? So that that's that. It shifted gears, and then Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9. But if you look at everything that goes on with that Jew, including everything that went on in the Old Testament to include what they're going through now, you know what they call 1948 when it, when, in reference to Israel? They say that was when Israel was born again. That's what they say. And I thought, wow, that's deep, man. That's interesting you say that. Now, they don't, they don't use the term born again like you would, like as a Christian, but spiritually speaking, that is a very good type of what you're going through. And note this, the day Israel, 1948, the day Israel was born again, you know what happened to Israel? The day they declared themselves, they, they, they gave a declaration, right, of independence and statehood. Do you know what happened? Immediately, six Arab nations came up against them, right? And then there hasn't been a year in the life, the, the born-again life of Israel, since Israel got reestablished, right? There hasn't been a year, man, that they hadn't had the, to, 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 they hadn't been able to let their guard down, I guess is my point. Because everybody around them is out to get them. And every time they finally say, I'm going to compromise, and we'll just do this, and we'll just a little bit, and we'll be just like the world, they, they get stabbed in the back, they get surprise attacked, they get their people kidnapped, they get bombs blown up, and the only way they can keep peace is if they stay on guard and they constantly fight and they keep the enemy at bay. And when I look at that, because I've had conversations with enough Christians, and they'll say things like, Pastor, ever since I got saved, like, so when do we relax? When do we just like three years worth of nothing? That we're just at Disney World and we're at the beach and we're just relaxing. I'm like, man, I don't know. That's a good point. I don't like I don't know. Now you can leave Israel, I guess, and go live somewhere, but I know this about what's going on with the Jews all over the world. You know what's going on with them? They're coming after them now. And they gonna try to blend in over in America, and then all of a sudden all these Free, free Palestine and from the river to the sea. And a lot of them Jews, they ain't saying nothing. They don't want to be a part of the fight. You know what that's a great type of? Sadly, it's a type of a typical lay to see. And they're pretending like they ain't part of this fight. And they're going to sit back in the corner while they see some of the brothers and sisters are trying to stand up, their own brothers and sisters, and get it in the neck. Eventually, they're going to figure out that they're Jews. What I think is going to happen now, I don't know if it's going to happen before the, the, the rapture or not, but eventually the Jews are all going to be back in Israel. Matter of fact, I've already heard him say, you know what, the only place we feel safe is with our people. And you say, well, how do you apply that to Christianity? Because you got a bad habit of wanting to stay away from your people. And, you know, it sounds you know, we'll be in church. That's all you guys ever say. I don't know what else to say because there's that. There's that. That is what that is. That's a gathering together. That we're we're going to be gathered together. We're going to be together. But you don't want to be together now. The Jews are going to be together. They don't want to be together now. And you know what God's allowing to happen to those Jews in New York City? He's allowing them to get. And and over there, I don't know if you saw what happened in on the West Coast in Los Angeles, whatever. They started attacking or getting a hold of people in that synagogue. And they're like, the Jews are freaking out. They don't understand what's going on. I know what's going on. I got a Bible. I know exactly what's coming their way, and, and it breaks my heart to know what's happening. But you know what? As far as we're concerned, that is our role, man. We're supposed to, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. The, the thing I can tell you, man, is, is be around people that know this book. Make sure that your friends, like, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
And what you got, just like in the days of Lot, the Lord says, look, it's like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. When I'm coming, I'm going to tell you. And there's so much more than just the days of Noah and the days of Lot, but I just think it's very easy just to, okay, well, that's pretty easy to figure out. And one of the key characteristics in the days of Lot is they linger. They don't, they don't, there's no level of commitment, right? Look at verse, uh, uh, let's see, look at verse 15 again. He says, and when the morning rose, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So he's telling those, he, those angels are telling Lot, look, get your family up out of here, right? Because of this iniquity right here of the city. And it's the communication, it's the company that you keep that's going to be the downfall of your level of Christianity and your fellowship with God. So if you read 1 John chapter 1, there's all this about confessing sin and stuff. And, and prior to the confessing to sin stuff in 1 John chapter 1, it's the fellowship. And it's fellowshipping with me and you and Jesus Christ. That's the fellowship, see? And unless you learn that, unless you understand the importance of it, then you're going to be like Lot's wife, you're going to be like their daughters, you're going to be like Lot, and it'll be like, well, we finally made it out, right? Look at verse 16. Now, I don't know what other message these two angels need to tell Lot, but up to this point, Lot hasn't committed. And you know how you know that is because of everything that took place from 1 to 15, verse 16 comes around. And when you read verse 16, out of everything that you saw, these sodomites surrounding your house and coming after these angels, the angel guys, the sons of God here, they're doing all this and you still hadn't gotten a message yet that Sodom isn't the place to be, see? And I don't know how many times I've seen Christian after Christian after Christian and their families this happens, that happens, crazy stuff, especially the crazy stuff. I've seen so many times where I get the phone calls or I hear about this or people come and talk to us and say, Pastor, you never guess what happened. And, oh, Pastor, please pray for us. I'm like, all right, so what happened? And the weirdest stuff happens. And what I've known over the years, when it's the weird, like, like what I've known over the years, this is what I picked up. If anything happens, the first thing I do, I stub my toe, man, immediately I say, you're right. You're right, you're right, you're right. Let me just sit up a little straighter. Anything that happens, I've already known to acknowledge the Lord and all that stuff. And most Christians, because they're surrounded with so many distractions, everything that they've, everything they're picking up on on Netflix or TV or whatever, the umpteen hours people spend on, go watch whatever you want to watch, man. But duty's never conflict. You better get a hold of that Bible. You better learn what's happening because. Whether you want to, to go to heaven or not, and you would think that'd be a crazy thing, like who that's saved doesn't want to go to heaven? And I would tell you, I thought, yeah, just like, like you would think none of them are until you talk to them. And I'm telling you, man, I've run into enough Christians. It's a sickness, man. They don't want to go to heaven. And Lot didn't want to leave. And then it's like Lord says, okay, well, look at Lot. I'll tell you what it's going to be like when I come. Yeah, how's it going to be? They're going to linger. They're going to mess around. Look at verse 16. And while he lingered, the men had to lay hold of him. You know what that means? They had to grab a hold of him. You know what I don't want from you? I don't need the Lord grabbing hold of you. And you know what I know about this? If God has to grab a hold of you, shake you up, he knows how to shake you up. He got a shaking you up machine, man, that you, you, don't, you can't possibly imagine. And I've been that guy long enough prior to come down to my calling. And my calling, I told you before, is South Florida. Arkansas ain't be South Florida. Arkansas is not South Florida. But I was living it up. I was going to church and I was doing my thing. I was even involved in the jail ministry. And you know what, man? My family, we're good. I Cars, the house, all that stuff that you keep hearing about. Oh, yeah, 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 I got that too. And that's great. If, if that's what God wants you to have, and that's where God wants you to be. But if that ain't what God wants you to have, and that isn't where God wants you to be, get ready to get shook up. And you would much rather present yourself and let the preaching shake you up than for God to catch you and shake you up. And God had to shake me up, and he shook me up. And uh, how you look at it now, Pastor? Now... I can laugh at it. 
But as I was going through it, I, will, I promise you I wasn't laughing. Now I'm so happy that he did it. But as I was going through that shakeup, I wasn't happy. And I know this too, enough of this Bible to know that I could have avoided a lot of that shakeup myself. If I just learn, if you just learn to avoid, no, to, to confess your own sin, right? And the fear of the Lord, remember, is what? It's a lot of things. It's the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom, right? But today's American, because the way God's being preached in most churches, let me just say, he's your friend, he ain't your dog. And you got this weird Jesus being preached out there like we, did you say, did you read the bulletin? So, so what I put in the bulletin was, what's being presented as the gospel today is, is very iffy, man. Because they got this stuff going on. It's like our number one goal is to not offend you. And the cross is, a, is an offense. It's called an offense. So I don't know, because you could put flowers around the cross. Do you know what the cross was, by the way? It's a it's a curse spiritually, but physically it's a torture. You torture people. You don't kill people on the cross. You just they die on the cross. So like if Jesus Christ was hung, what would you what would what was the what would you have on the pulpit like a noose? If he was shot, would you have a pistol? You put a pistol around your neck because Jesus was shot for our sins. No, see that sounds crazy, but you know what the cross is, right? It's a torture device. It's so it's a it's an instrument of death. That's execution. So we do this stuff as a kid. I you know I had no idea. Okay, you did it. I did it. The priest does it. And does this. We all do it. What is that? According to your Bible in Gen uh, Galatians three, it's a curse. So what'd you do with that? I stopped doing that. I got enough problems with my flesh. I don't need to put myself cursed as everyone that hangeth on a tree. And I just did it. So he's lingering, right? And look look at verse 6. He said, the men laid hold of him and upon his hand and his wife, right? Got both of you. And upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful. Correct? Brother, you better underline that merciful thing, man. Because without that, you and I wouldn't be here today. How about that one? And the more Bible you read, the more... The bigger God gets, but yeah, the key, he's this guy, he's this being that this, this, this fills heaven and earth. Oh boy, he has a personal relationship with you. Huh? Remember see, uh, this is a counterfeit, maybe it's not the best illustration. You ever see Aladdin? You ever see uh, the guy turns into a, 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 a genie? Cosmic, big cosmic power, itty bitty living space. So here's God. Oh, I'm God, blah, blah, blah. but I'm inside of you. And I have a personal relationship with you, and I know everything about you. But I also made the universe. Ah, but I'm also war. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. You say, well, man, we're in the back end of this Nazarene church, man. It doesn't seem like a lot going on. And the Lord said, I'm here, and it's going on. And I've learned to accept my role as a pastor, and I've learned to accept my lot, and I've learned to accept my measure, and I've learned to accept my responsibility, and I've learned to accept my, my position as a husband and a father and a pastor and a Christian and you know whatever else hat you wear, and I got it. We all got a lot of hats to wear, but we also have the grace of God. And if it wasn't for the mercy, the Lord being merciful unto him, right, and they, and they brought him forth and set him without the sin. When when you are going to be set without the city, one of these days Jesus Christ is coming back. See, and the idea in that rapture, it'd be like, uh, and we'll close with this. It'll be like, uh, so so you you ever go to the store and see these little kids in the toy section, right? And they're all grabbing stuff, and mom's having you know conniption. Feel well, but one time it was that. The nanny, who was watching the two kids, spoiled kids, they're all in the toy section. And the nanny had told the two kids, you know what, we got to go. And daddy says it's time to go. And she grabbed a hold of those two boys, and she was dragging them kids behind her. And them kids are kicking and screaming and bouncing behind her. And that nanny's just whistling, time to go home. Time to go home, right? 
And that is the quintessential picture of the Laodicean when it comes to this day right here. So instead of looking forward to the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back, and he's told us over and over again, and our temptation is to linger, like, all right, we could do this all tomorrow, right? We need to get to the point of our level of Christianity to where we're looking forward to Jesus Christ coming back, that we're wanting to see his face. And I don't know what else to tell you other than, like, so how do you get to that point of your Christianity? You got to gotta be in your Bible. Like, what else? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you other than that. And I'm telling you, it's a great thing. I, I could watch these two old men talking about nothing. And no mention of Jesus Christ whatsoever. No mention of the Bible, nothing. Other than, I can hit a ball farther than you can. Oh, you're crazy. Brr. I thought, wow, what, what, what do we come to, man? And then it explains, be honest with you, because if you know about the last days, men will be lovers of their own selves and lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, which then explains why God's got those two guys for you. Say, all right, that's all you do anyways. You want to, you want to, you know, skip out on your responsibilities and stuff and go play all day. Then that's who you're going to get. Two of the most powerful individuals on, on the planet talking about who can hit a golf ball for them. And I saw that, man, and I went, that's good. I'm good. And my prayer today, like it has been, since I figured it out, even so, come Lord Jesus. Father, bless the day. We thank you for it. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord. Be with your people. Pray for traveling mercies, Lord. But, Father, it's coming. I can't. We're checking these boxes here. This is what you said. These are going to be like the days of Noah and Lot. And we're able to study out the days of Noah and Lot. I don't know how many more things we got left to check because it seems like every last one of them are being checked, which means we're out of time. I know time started in the Middle East, and I can't turn the television on or pick up my phone without hearing about news from the Middle East, which would seem to indicate we're out, we're done, we've, we've discovered everything. The only place left to go is up. So we love and thank you. We plead the blood. Pray you come soon. In Jesus' name, bless the food, of course, and the fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen.